Fictional, the book podcast for book lovers by book lovers from the Port Moody Public Library. I am your host today, Al, and I am joined by my book friends, Sadie, Emma, Virginia, and Corrine. So today we are talking about obsessions, specifically my obsession. And if you have listened to this podcast in the past, you may be aware that I am a great lover of vampire media. So, of course, how could I pass up the chance to force all of my book friends to read some vampire media? Now, I am truly excited to see what my book friends have found for us today, because as some of you may know, the, uh, the breadth of vampire media is great. There is so much out there, and I'm really excited to see what everyone has found to bring to the table today. So I think today we are going to start with Kareen. Kareen, uh, it sounds like you've got something exciting for us. I sure do, Al. I sure do. Um, As is my patented method, I went into the catalog, clicked in vampire uh, in title and went with the first one that was there um, and kind of lucked out this time. Um, I'm very excited to be repping the romance genre today um, with a book that definitely has a vampire in it and in the title. Just for you, Al. Just for you. So, the Craigslist ad has to be too good to be too too good to be true. Right? Cassie Greenberg is a down on her luck artist with massive student loans, as is tradition. Um, she's living in Chicago as kind of a part time children's librarian slash other odd jobs, but she is still struggling to make ends meet, and she is about to be evicted from her apartment due to the whole not paying rent thing. Um, And so she's a little bit desperate. She's been living on her best friend's couch for a while, but he's a newlywed and kind of wants to spend time with his husband. Uh, So it's a little awkward. So she really needs to sort this out and fast. And so she does what any desperate person does. She turns to Craigslist. Sorting through all of the rent that is deeply out of her budget, she stumbles across an ad that seems perfect. It's in a great location next to the L train, huge windows. Um, it's furnished. Her roommate slash landlord uh, works nights and sleeps during the day, so they would rarely have any interactions. And this, again, utilities covered. Utilities covered. All of this in a package for $200 a month. Now, all of my fellow renters here just had a bit of a conniption um, because that, again, seems very realistic and is probably written by a serial killer. So thinks Cassie, but she's also a little desperate. So she decides to take a chance and meet and tour the apartment. There she meets hmm, Frederick J. Fitzwilliam. Um... (laughs) And his jewel of a property in downtown Chicago, the furniture is a little bit old and seems like from another era. The kitchen is a little dusty and seems unused, and there doesn't seem to be anything in the fridge. His manners are fine, if a little old-fashioned, and so she thinks, why not? $200? What could go wrong? As soon as she moves into this very nice, if a little old-fashioned apartment, she starts to notice some very strange things about Frederick. He only communicates to her with handwritten ink letters with wax seals. (laughs) He only works at night and keeps the curtains drawn during the day. His shift work is very strange. The... (laughs) When she said furnished, he doesn't have any pots and pans, which seems odd for someone who has such a nice kitchen. And any food that he had seems to be just odds and ends. What on earth can this man be eating? Slash not cooking with no pots and pans. He also doesn't know what Wi-Fi is um, and doesn't know how to take out the garbage. Is he an average man? 
No, he's so much more. The apartment is also cold. Very cold. Too cold. But he's also really hot. So it's fine. Um, he's a, again, his manners kind of seem from a different era. He wears lots of cravats. He's really bad at texting. Um, he thinks that TikTok is a clock. Um, but he's really nice and like kind of polite and a little naive and hot, like really, really hot. Um, but she soon learns that beneath that hot exterior beats the cold heart of a killer, Bella. The cold heart of a killer. However, we already know that because this book is called My Roommate is a Vampire um, by Jen Levine. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, that is what it says. It, her roommate is a vampire. There he is right there hanging upside down, being a vampire and apparently very good looking and sweet. Um, this is a lighthearted debut romance from Jenna Levine, um, which, as I was just telling my book friends earlier, started as a Raylo fan fiction, and I didn't realize it until 10 minutes ago, and it's kind of blowing my mind. It all begins to make sense. However, um, if you are a huge fan of fan fiction and enjoy romantic tropes and love seeing someone kind of hit all of those romantic beats really really well like someone who just understands the genre and is doing your snappy dialogue is doing like your pining is doing but they were roommates like it all works on a really really good level so um <laughs> i will i will be frank out i i don't mind a vampire i don't find them like i don't find vampires like sexy in a way that people like when the whole twilight thing came up i was like he's just like a really extreme opposite end vegan like he just has some interesting dietary preferences like i don't i don't really get the whole vampire mystique thing um so i'm really interested to see like other takes on it from other book friends to see kind of what they do with the vampire in this case um he's he just has a lot of old money and old generational wealth from himself um, and apparently is played by Adam Driver. But I also think the Fitzwilliam thing is a Pride and Prejudice reference, which I see Jenna Levine and I appreciate. Um, so if you are looking for a very, very silly romance that you will just kind of like as you're reading it, like kick your little feet like so cute they're going on a clothing shopping montage <laughs> um then you will very much enjoy this book as i did so yeah that's my roommate is a vampire by jenna levine that sounds delightful like it's silly but it sounds like it's got a lot of heart and what else can we really ask for so this is one type of vampire media one of the sort of sillier, lighter hearted elements of vampire media. Let's go to Sadie and see what other kind of vampire media we've got. All right. Now, much like Al, I really do love a good vampire book <laughs> or a bad vampire book, to be honest. <laughs> I, I, I enjoy consuming vampire media as well. Um, and for me, a good vampire book usually does mean a classic paranormal vampire romance. Uh, one of my favorite book series and shows now is A Discovery of Witches uh, by Deborah Harkness. And it definitely features quite prominently some good old-fashioned vampire romance, which is thrown in there. Always a bonus as well. And so when I was thinking about this topic, that's kind of where my mind first went to. I have lots on my red list already. I could look at my to-be-read list and discover something new. I even had one picked out um, that I'm definitely going to be going back to at some point. Um, it is a historical atmospheric queer vampire romance, which I am very excited to read. But then I shifted a little bit and I went in a completely different direction. Um, so me and my husband have recently finally started catching up on the show What We Do in the Shadows. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the show, I'll give you a little, very brief overview. Um, it is a darkly comedic mockumentary, uh, and it documents the lives of four vampires and one human familiar who live together in a big mansion in Staten Island. It is weird, it is absurd, subversive, and absolutely hilarious. 
I find myself ending most episodes being like, uh, what, what, what just happened? Um, what? <laughs> and I really do recommend it to everyone. So instead of going with my classic vampire romance, when I was picking a book for this episode, I decided to look for something that would fit in with my current vampire obsession. So I set out to find a What We Do in the Shadows read-alike. Now, these lists are fairly easy to find. Uh, so I picked out two titles from the list, and I actually had my husband be the tiebreaker. And this is what he selected. The Utterly Uninteresting and Unadventurous Tales of Fred, the Vampire Accountant by Drew Hayes. I think it's also important to note um, that this is now the second vampire book where the vampire is named Frederick. Just going to point that out there. <laughs> Just, yep. Why not? Um, so this book is the first uh, book of the Fred the Vampire Accountant series, uh, and it is described as, for all you Shadows fans out there, if Colin Robinson had a book series written about him, this would be it. After reading the book, I don't fully agree with this statement, but I will get into that a little bit later after I've told you a bit about the book. So Frederick Frankford Fletcher, C.P.A. Late 20s, socially awkward, huge self-esteem issues. The kind of person who definitely didn't peak in high school or in college. And now, 10 years later, he's starting to wonder if he ever will. He works from home, doesn't really have any friends, not really social life to speak of, definitely doesn't have a dating life. Oh, and he's a vampire. Although... This fact doesn't really change too much about his life. He doesn't have a lot of memories of the night about a year ago when he was turned. He was attacked while he was walking one night, and he just kind of woke up like this. In, in all honesty, he passed out. And when he uh, came to, this is what had happened. Now his diet is slightly different. He can't go out during the day, hence the working from home. He's stronger and faster than he used to be although he rarely uses his newfound physical abilities. He can hear better. That one's kind of cool. And he has finally been able to shed those last few pounds that he has never really been able to as a human. But otherwise, life is pretty much the same. He works, he has dinner, maybe a glass of wine, he goes to bed, he doesn't really sleep, but he goes to bed, gets up, and does the whole thing over again. Now, Fred is a little bit confused because he figured that by getting turned into a vampire, as media would lead us to believe, he would have become a smooth, suave, good-looking, slightly dangerous, risk-taking vampire. But sadly, it seems that isn't exactly how it all works. Fred is basically the exact same person he was before, only now he has the added perk of not being able to throw up. But things are about to change. He's made a decision, and he's going to be more spontaneous in his life. And so he's decided to attend his high school reunion. So he drives through the night to get to the hotel. He checks in right before dawn, emerging again when the sun goes down and entering his high school once again. He doesn't really know what to expect. He did have some friends in high school, none of which were popular, and none who he has really kept in touch with. And now, after he's been sitting at the reunion for about an hour, he's starting to think that none of them are going to make an appearance. So he's just going to leave. But just before he leaves, he's joined at the table by Crystal. Now, Crystal had been a friend by association in high school. They were never really that close, but definitely part of the same social circle. And, you know, a familiar face is always nice. Now, Fred is more or less exactly the same as he was in high school, but Crystal has changed significantly. She's fit, she's gorgeous, she's funny and confident. And when, after chatting for a few minutes, she hastily excuses herself, Fred figures that she probably just realized that a boring accountant who hasn't changed in the last 10 years isn't really worth her newly confident time. So once again, Fred is just about to leave. When the reunion is interrupted, by a blood-curdling scream. And the smell of something that Fred is now very familiar with. Blood. 
The reunion goes into a panic. The doors to the outside have been locked, and anyone who tries to exit into the school hallways seems to be instantly attacked by something. Finally, having a reason to use his super strength and physical abilities, Fred jumps into action. He jumps up to the bleachers. He jumps up to the second floor into the commentator's box, and he hides. There, in the dark, he finds Crystal, bound and gagged and very, very angry. He immediately releases her and is surprised when she starts giving him tips on how to escape, saying that she needs to stay and she will be fine. Well, Fred has never really been the heroic type, so he is fine with just leaving. So he goes about finding his way out of the school. He's gotten out. He's running along the roofs of the line of cars, trying to escape from what he now realizes is a pack of werewolves, uh, led by the douchey former football star and Fred's own high school bully, Brent Coulter. Fred is sure that he's made it when he is tackled from the side and knocked unconscious. Now, Fred can't actually be knocked unconscious, but he figures that it's probably better to just pretend and not alert this werewolf pack to his own supernatural status. So he's brought back into the school along with all of the other reunion guests, and Brent proceeds to lecture the group about how sacrificing them all will allow his pack to rise into power, forcing all the humans of the world to cower before them. Now, once again, Fred is not the heroic type. However, he also isn't the kind of person to just let a whole gym full of people to be killed especially when he could probably do something about it. Also, in a strange turn of luck, everyone else is still wearing blindfolds, which means he can use his extreme speed and strength to overpower the wolves and save everyone and still be able to walk away anonymously as a vampire. So Fred jumps into action once again. He yanks a nearby fire extinguisher off the wall. He rips the metal open with his teeth, something he doesn't really recommend doing if you're not a vampire. And this causes enough of a scramble and confusion for Fred to start to untie the rest of the guests. It's also in the middle of this mess of white fire extinguisher solution and confusion that Crystal comes back and the gunshots start. Now, after this whole mess has been cleaned up, the reunion guests have been released and an official story has been broadcast to the media, Fred and Crystal finally get a chance to catch up fully. It turns out that Crystal identified Fred as a vampire almost immediately because Crystal has been trained to know supernaturals, or parahumans, as she calls them. She works for a government agency tasked with keeping good relations with the parahumans and taking down any who act out. She had been dispatched to the reunion as her organization had gotten wind of a possible werewolf uprising. And since she was already invited, it made sense that she would go and scope out the situation and be on hand in case anything escalated. She's also really glad to have reconnected with Fred and is curious if he would like to go on a date. Now, the rest of the story is separated into different books, each detailing a different adventure and a different supernatural creature that Fred is introduced to, uh, mostly because of his new relationship with Crystal. Uh, these adventures include zombies and necromancers at a LARPing event, dragon-blooded humans and were-ponies in Las Vegas, mages, dragons, and more vampires. Each story kind of adds more to Fred's friends and family in a ridiculous, campy way, and the end has a reveal that definitely sets the book up for many sequels in the future. Now, as you can probably tell from this description, this book is a lot of fun. It definitely doesn't take itself too seriously. Each character is written as a pretty excellent satire of the more recognizable supernatural creatures. It's written in an episodic way that definitely makes me think about shows like Buffy or Charmed, um, kind of what we do in the shadows, kind of where each week the protagonists have to face another supernatural foe, all of which is wrapped up in 30 to 60 minutes or five to seven chapters. I would say that it wasn't the most exciting book, um, and as some of the humor was extremely campy, it didn't always land perfectly. Uh, the reveal at the end also seemed like it was adding one too many elements into the story. Also, as I mentioned, I do not agree with the fact that this is Colin Robinson in book form. Uh, as Fred really does strive to be more of an exciting 
and confident person. And I think that he truly hoped that by getting turned into a vampire, he would finally get to be that smooth, sexy person that he wasn't in high school. And Colin Robinson really gets a lot of pleasure out of boring the world around him and feeding off of the draining energy. And I don't think he has any ideas of grandeur or sexiness. But that being said, I did find myself enjoying the stories and the characters. I think that there may have been a couple of laugh out loud moments or at least roll your eyes and groan out loud moments. I'm not sure if I'll revisit the series, at least not right away. But I do think that it's a great series to kind of have on the go uh, if you're ever wanting to have just something lighthearted and easy uh, that you can go back to in between some maybe some heavier books. I think that this book would definitely appeal to those who are fans of supernatural shows like Charmed, Buffy, uh, Dirk Gently, Sabrina, and even What We Do in the Shadows, or anyone who enjoys a campy, satirical, supernatural story. Uh, so once again, this is the utterly uninteresting and unadventurous tales of Frank, the Vampire Accountant by Drew Hayes. Thanks, Sadie. I love when vampire media kind of subverts the stereotypical view of what a vampire is so this sounds right up my alley just with a lot of a lot of humor and a lot of fun so thank you for bringing us that and next for a dramatic shift in tone uh, yeah. we are going to go to emma so emma what have you got for our listeners today yeah, as Mal Al mentioned, my book is definitely uh, very different from what both Sadie and Corrine read. While Sadie read something that was kind of subversive of the typical vampire genre, um, my book is very much like a seminal text in the vampire genre. Like this is a book that set the tone for how vampire books were written following it. Um, so this is from 1871. The book is called Carmilla by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. Um, and just a little kind of backstory of how I chose this book. When I first saw we were doing a vampire episode, I initially was thinking of reading a spinoff from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I'm a huge Buffy fan. I, I don't really find vampires like sexy or desirable until I met Spike from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He is my favorite. Karina's is laughing at me right now. I just I love I love James Marsters so much, and I think his portrayal of Spike is just so iconic. Um, I love a punk. I love an antihero. I love like a redemptive evil character. Um, so originally, when I first saw that this was our topic for this week, um, I had a friend recommend a Spike kind of prequel novel to the Buffy series. It's called Bloody Fool for Love. If you're a Buffy fan, you could check that one out. Um, but then I was thinking, you know, maybe because that's very a very specific book, very a very good suggestion for people who really love Buffy and who really love Spike the character like I do. Um, but for the podcast, I wanted to choose something that was maybe maybe had a bit of a wider appeal. And this book absolutely still appealed to me um, since it's like I said before, it's such like uh, iconic kind of seminal text in uh in the history of horror the history of vampire literature and it's a book about sapphic lesbian vampires which is very very up my alley so um for this book for, for today like i said i'm reading i read carmilla by joseph sheridan Le Fanu, and the version that i read is edited by the queer horror expert carmen maria machado who is the perfect person to have kind of as a guide through this incredible text so a little bit about the story itself. We have our narrator, Laura, who lives in an isolated mansion in a forest in Styria, which is a state in south the southeast of Austria, with only her father and a few servants to keep her company. Laura's father is English, and her mother is a Styrian lady who died in her infancy. So her father chose to stay in Styria kind of for the financial benefit. It's a lot uh, cheaper for them to stay in Styria than to go back to England. Laura and her father are intended to host a general who has a very funny name that I will probably mispronounce. It's Spielsdorf uh, and his niece, Mademoiselle Reinfeldt, at their manor, much to Laura's excitement since she's never really had a companion her own age before. However, her father receives a letter stating that, stating that the general's visit will be delayed by many weeks, and his niece will no longer be joining since she has died from mysterious circumstances. Now, Laura is devastated to receive this letter. She'd been looking forward to having this companionship for so long. It's a companionship that she's always really longed for. And now she's grieving the death of a friend that she never had the opportunity to meet. Her devastation is soon overtaken by curiosity and horror. Uh, they hear a procession quickly approaching outside. 
the sound of many hooves and carriage wheels crossing the bridge towards their mansion. When Laura and her father go to see who's approaching their home, they find a carriage overturned and two horses sprawled out on the ground. A young woman has been thrown from the carriage and is stunned, but she's certainly not dead. An older woman emerges from the procession and, in a dramatic and quite theatrical monologue, exclaims that she can no longer take her frail daughter on her journey with her. She asks that Laura and her father immediately take her into, her care, into their care, and they immediately oblige. Laura is ecstatic to finally have a companion her own age, and for some reason, neither her nor her father ever really consider the potential dangers of welcoming a stranger in their home. Clearly, these people have never read a vampire book before, because the first rule of vampires is to not invite them inside. If Buffy taught me anything, it taught me that. Um, so Laura clearly doesn't realize this, but maybe she also doesn't really realize or believe that vampires exist. So she welcomes her new friend into her home, whose name we learn is Carmilla. Now, Laura describes Carmilla as kind of an odd character. She's very secretive and sometimes erratic, but at the same time, she's extremely intelligent and graceful and extremely beautiful and very, very alluring. Laura's descriptions of Carmilla are contradictory to one another. She instantly feels a very intense desire and draw towards Carmilla, but simultaneously is repulsed by her and afraid of her, and she can't explain why. But Carmilla is charming and beautiful, so the attraction prevails, and the two young women spend every day together. And throughout this time they spend together, Laura learns very little about Carmilla. She only learns her first name, that her family is ancient and very noble, and that her home is somewhere vaguely in the West. And despite being charming and poised, Carmilla is also sometimes very volatile and angry. Once, when she and Laura are out in the forest, they're having a picnic together, the two witness a funeral procession passing them. Laura is immediately very sympathetic towards the funeral, and Carmilla has an outburst at Laura for sympathizing with these mourners. Despite her outburst, however, Laura cannot keep at bay her intense desire and attraction towards Carmilla. Now, one night, Laura has a nightmare. She dreams of a large black cat-like creature prowling around the edge of her bed, and then it springs onto her bed and bites her right on the breast. Then the figure of a woman appears next to her and just as quickly disappears from the room. Laura has multiple visions like this of creatures in her room, of creatures biting her, and of a woman next to her bed drenched in blood. And as her dreams gradually become more vivid, it becomes clearer to her that that woman she keeps seeing looks just like Carmilla. As these nightmares continue, Laura's health gradually weakens, and Carmilla becomes increasingly more devoted to her, to vampires' growing desire and attraction towards her victim. Now, Carmilla's own actions become more and more suspicious as this is happening. She's disappearing at night, and young women in a nearby village continue to die from mysterious circumstances, much like the late Mademoiselle Reinfeldt, who was supposed to visit Laura at the beginning of the story. And when Laura and her father are finally reunited with General Spielsdorf, when he finally arrives for that visit that was delayed, he recounts the circumstances of his niece's death to them, and so begins their hunt for the vampire that's responsible for the seduction and murder of all of these young women. Now, I loved this book. I thought it was so fun. It's a really, really rapid read. It's only about 139 pages. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm a huge fan of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So anything with kind of like women protagonists, powerful women, vampires, that kind of stuff definitely appeals to me. Um, with Buffy, I love that the show portrays vampires not really just as evil monsters, but as very complex beings with desires and with the capacity for redemption, as we see in Spike's character. Um, and also Angel, but I like Spike more. <laughs> uh, while Carmilla is definitely more cruel and malevolent, she is also still quite morally, or she's more cruel than she is morally ambiguous. But she's one of the earliest representations of the vampire as representing sexual desire. And I had never heard of Carmilla before researching books to read for this week. And I was so excited to learn that one of the earliest vampire novels was also a work of lesbian fiction. So immediately that drew me to the book. Um, Carmen Maria Machado, who provides footnotes and a lovely introduction to the book, is a queer writer who kind of specializes in queer horror, and she's an excellent guide through this. Her footnotes provide some context for the geography mentioned, kind of historical contents for the way that geography uh, has changed since the time period of the book, 
And she reminds readers of some of the more problematic elements of the book without really taking away from the original text. Um, and Carmilla as a text has an incredible legacy. It was written 25 years before Dracula, which is arguably the most famous vampire novel. And it marks the beginning of lesbian vampires as a recurring trope in fiction. This trope even makes its way into Buffy. Um, and the book was adapted into multiple films and a Canadian web series that was filmed in Toronto. So if you're interested in Carmilla, you should definitely check that out as well. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed this book. Like I said, it was a very rapid read. I kind of blasted through it. And uh, Machado's humorous footnotes were really fun and provided a lot of good uh, contextual background information for it. And the book that I read, the edition I read, also had some really beautiful illustrations in it that kind of help readers envision that attraction between Carmilla and Laura, um, especially when you can see the characters and see them depicted in scenes together. If you're a fan of Gothic literature or Victorian literature or other vampire novels like Dracula, I would absolutely consider Carmilla required reading. Um, or if you just like lesbian fiction or want to check out a classic in that genre, you should check out this book. Um, check out the sapphic vampire that started it all. Um, overall, this book was ethereal. It was frightening. It was endlessly strange. And I really loved it. So if that sounds like something you might enjoy, you should definitely read Carmilla by Joseph Sheridan Lefranu. Thanks, Emma. I was so excited when I saw that you were reading Carmilla for this week. Uh, like you said, it is a seminal example of vampire fiction. And I love that one of the first examples of sort of vampire fiction as we think of it today is a sapphic romance. Well, not quite a romance. A, a, a sapphic vampire novel. Um, a tale of sapphic desire. <laughs> yes. Um, wonderful story. Definitely add to the recommendation here. So before we move on, I'm going to go to our existential question of the day. And for our existential question, it's going to be a bit of a throwback to the early 2000s. And I'm just going to ask, vampires or werewolves? <laughs> I can go because mine's easy. Vampires, 100% vampires. No question. Definitely vampires. No follow-up. Back in the early days of Twilight, I was definitely team werewolf because I liked Taylor Lautner more than I liked uh, what's his, Robert Pattinson. Forgot his name for a sec. Um, but nowadays, I think uh, I'm absolutely, absolutely team vampire. And we can uh, attribute that to James Marster's portrayal of Spike. <laughs> Angel was a sad sack, wasn't he? Just a sad Also, uh, I go on the record here. David Boreanaz cannot act. No argument here, actually. None. And yet he continues to work. Hey, anyways. Ooh, Al, this is a really tricky one because... I kind of like the idea of werewolves, like they're compelled by larger natural forces outside of their control. Um, but also half the time they're kind of like dogs, which I don't like. Um, and vampires just seem a lot more hygienic, but then there's also the blood thing. But they do have generational wealth that you can exploit. So wait, am I dating them or am I like supporting them? Is there a war? Like what's what's the con? Up to you. Up to you. Help me out, Al. Help me out. Give me my criteria. I mean, just which one do you like better? Like, I don't know. Like better to like read story. I don't know. Uh, Based on just sheer financial advantages, I'm going to go with vampires um, because I feel like werewolves, like when they live in their pack, there's like a little bit of like social communism and I'd rather have the nice place in Chicago. I have absolutely no feelings about this, but I feel like I'm just going to say werewolves because everybody said vampires. How about that? Just because... Yeah, um, I I mean, nobody is going to be surprised when I say vampires. Um, this is my episode. My episode is about vampires. It is a harder question than, like, I would think that some people might think, because I really love, like, 
the themes that tend to surround werewolves of like Kareen said sort of like being compelled by natural forces outside of you having to sort of fight the beast within but there's also kind of an element of fighting the beast within with vampires so and then vampires also just have sort of more smoothness more suaveness it's it's about the seductive quality of evil um rather than the bestial quality so yeah i i'm gonna be on team vampire for this they're just this classy say- oh, sorry. they're just classy but you I mean, did not say all you were of them, a wolf like- kid before al <laughs> right i remember you saying that you were a wolf kid when you were a kid when you were it a was child. a wolf kid when I was a kid. So. Yeah, I, I do like wolves. Wolves are very cool. Um, I do think werewolves are very cool. But if I have to choose between werewolves and vampires, I'm going to choose vampires. You think if we're just looking at it on like an aesthetic level, because werewolf chic is very much like a lot of plaid, a lot of like, what is it? Timberland boots. It's a lot of like distressed denim in the wilderness. So um, lesbians. And also like lumberjacks. <laughs> I feel like I feel like werewolf fashion is lumberjack fashion and like Carmilla like she's a femme she's still a lesbian but she's dressed all like elegantly true, I don't know. True. <laughs> yeah. yeah I feel like werewolves do a lot of camping the werewolves are butch is what we're saying yeah. <laughs> and I guess this is like the question I have for you because they're all like metaphors right so like the werewolf is a metaphor for the beast within and then vampires are about unnatural desires is that is that a shtick i mean that's a really complicated question because vampires have been a metaphor for a lot of different things they've been a metaphor for um sexual desire and sort of the dangers of that they've been a metaphor for capitalism and the way that the rich prey on the lower classes they've been a metaphor for all sorts of things so um yeah that's that's a complicated question i wouldn't accept that i was just i reading this vampire romance like why does it matter that he's a vampire like what's the what's the appeal here but when you kind of talk about the, the upper rich upper classes like sucking the lifeblood out of the poor i'm like oh it's a metaphor for he's a rich mama's boy i get it All right. So thank you for uh, indulging me with our existential question today. Um, So we're going to move on to Virginia, who I'm really excited to see what you have for us today uh, with regards to vampire media. All right. Um, So, I mean, having heard three book friends already talk about vampires, you probably have some idea of what a vampire is, I guess. You might think of them as Sleeping all day, sleeping in a coffin, afraid of garlic, afraid of sunlight, that you can kill them by driving a stick through the heart, they drink blood, or if you get bitten by a vampire, then you get turned into a vampire and all of that. And that is exactly what 17-year-old Domingo thinks also, because he learns all that he knows about vampires from comic books and other media. But then he realizes how wrong he is when he meets Ado a real vampire. In Domingo's world, vampires exist. People know about them. It's not a secret. And yes, vampires are powerful, but there are very, very few of them because in this world, you can't make vampires. You don't get turned into vampires. Um, When you get bitten, you can only be a vampire if you were born a vampire. So there are still way, 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 way more humans. And so humans get to say where the vampires go. Many countries, after discovering that vampires exist, have actually decided to enforce a lot of restrictions on the vampire population. Um, They set up certain designated areas that the vampires can live in. There are certain cities that are off-limits to vampires. And many countries, especially those in Europe, also deport all their vampires. And so the vampires get moved, they're forced to go somewhere else. And of course, then they come into conflict with the vampires that already live there in their new countries. Mexico City happens to be one of those off-limit cities. Vampires are not allowed. But Adol, a young vampire, is here. She's born in Mexico, and she's a descendant of the Aztec blood drinkers. And she's here because her clan 
is being persecuted by this other group of vampires called the necros. And they came from Europe and they are more like kind of the vampires that we picture. The necros have killed her family and she has barely escaped. And now she's in Mexico City looking for a human. Because her mother said that if you ever need help, there's someone in Mexico City that can get you out of the country. Just show them this pearl bead that we have. Of course, it's dangerous for her to be here in Mexico City. There are sanitation crews that do routine ID checks around the city. The necros, of course, are after her. They have sent two of theirs to go after her. And they don't have cool names like Frederick. They just named Nick. Um, and uh, she knows that they're in the city because they have left corpses that are drained of blood all around town. The necros don't care. They are. They have no restraints. They have no control. They they see humans that meet, and that's it. And they look at. Um, they often let their hunger takes over. And they, while Edo is trying to keep a low profile, the necros could care less. And they did not clean up after their feast one night. And so now, the necros are after them, and the cops also know that the vampires are in the city. And among the cops is Anne Aguirre, who is a seasoned detective who has just moved to Mexico City, hoping that she could avoid dealing with the vampires because she has a bit of a history with them and she's really good at capturing them. She's good at killing them. So she got a bit of a reputation. So, of course, she got assigned to the case. And um, now we have somebody who knows what they're doing is looking for her and any other vampires that are around in the town. But not only that, the drug cartel is also out to get her. One of the reasons why Mexico City is a vampire-free zone is because the humans want to control the drug trade in here. And so the vampires, if they come in, they see them as a threat to their profit margin. And so they are also eager to see the vampires gone. So basically, the whole world is after Adam. She's all by herself. Her family is all dead. And here is Domingo, a 17-year-old, so really just a kid. Domingo who lives on the street, who collects garbage to make a living. And this kid thinks Ado is the coolest person. Like, he's definitely, like, super interested in vampires. He thinks he knows a lot about them, even though he's all wrong. And he's probably a little bit infatuated with her. He has even offered her his blood so that, you know, to help her get a little bit better. And she thought, okay, fine, sure, I'll take your blood. And she sent him away thinking that that's that. But Domingo keeps coming back and keeps trying to offer her help. Now, Edo has no interest in taking a human companion like many vampires do. But even though she may not want to admit it, maybe she does need help and maybe Domingo can help her. So this kind of a fresh, a little bit different take on the vampire story is Certain Dark Things by Sofia Moreno-Garcia. Moreno-Garcia, of course, an author that we've talked about on this show a number of times. I believe she still lives in Vancouver, I think. And um, this book was actually released before Paul Moreno uh, Garcia was uh, like a household name with, you know, like Mexican Gothic and, you know, like other books that, you know, that becomes a lot more, make her really, really a popular author among readers. And because her books are so in demand, so they actually re released this book um, after that. And um, if you have read any of her books, one of the things you know may know about this author is that like she doesn't care about genre. She writes in all kinds of them. So she jumped from one to another, from one book to the next. And Moreno Garcia described this as a neo-noir kind of story. So you got the urban fantasy side of it with the vampires in the real world and also a bit of a crime thriller kind of story. And this book takes you, as you can imagine, right into Mexico City. And I think because of the setting, you know, it has a very different feel than some of the traditional vampire story that we might be more familiar with. And like many of her stories, she always uses these kind of familiar tales to kind of look at the effects of colonial colonialism. It's a fast-paced, action-packed story. It's a very quick read and it moves along, easy to follow. And even though you can tell that the author has created this kind of a new vampire look almost. Like, you know, she she clearly has very clear ideas of like what all these different subspecies of vampires around the world do and are like, you know. Um, but many readers are, are probably like the fact that the book is not 
bogged down by these details. You know, you don't have to like spend a lot of time trying to learn how this world works. And then there will be other readers, including me, who will want to see more, just want to see things flash out maybe a little bit more because they all sound so interesting. And she has like this appendix, you know, that lists out all the different types of vampires around the world. And it would be love to see like all that get incorporated in her story a little bit more and to see more of them. Um, and I think many readers will also be drawn to the character of Domingo, you know, and his unwavering like devotion and loyalty, you know, which of course makes a really good foil to Adol, who's more strong-willed, who's trying to be independent, trying to like say that I don't need anybody help and all of that, you know, and then you have Domingo who is like just so eager and so, you know, ready to help. Um, so if that kind of characters appeal to you, I think you really enjoy certain dark things. So yeah, like um a very different, maybe a different kind of vampire story. Um and if you're looking for something just, you know, maybe a little bit not as traditional um as what you expect vampires to be, um, I will um highly recommend you to check out uh, certain dark things by Sofia Moreno Garcia. And before I turn it back to Elle. Um, I just want to say um, that this is Elle's last episode on Keep It Fictional with us. Um, so I want to thank you for all the book recommendations that you have given us, L, for the last year. Um, I know that like with you here, you will always bring a science fiction, fantasy, and horror to the table and your love for those genres are totally infectious. And I know that we don't have to worry about having no representation of SFF on here with you um, there. And you have also introduced a lot of like, you know, queer stories and offers to us and to our listeners. So thank you for spotlighting those voices for this podcast. Um, I'm, I have to say, you're always so well prepared for the show and you always speak so eloquently, intelligently about the books that you recommend. I never have to edit any bits because you just like, you just everything just sounds perfect. So thank you, you know, and for all the thoughts that you put into these book recommendations. Um, and yeah, so since Vampires is your choice for today, um, you know, I, I don't know if you have talked about it enough to like, what what does Vampires, like, why do they appeal to you so much? Um, and uh, as you said, you consume so much vampire media. I'm dying to know kind of what vampire book that you end up choosing for this. Thank you so much, Virginia. Um, I've loved being here. I've loved being part of this podcast. So I'm really glad that I get to share this sort of love of mine uh, in my last episode. Um, vampires are a lot of things to me. They are like, I mean, there's there's obviously the sexy vampire. Everyone loves the sexy vampire. But like I was saying earlier, vampires can be a metaphor for so many different things. And I think they're just such a versatile sort of archetype that can be used in so many different ways, which I think this episode has demonstrated that there are so many different ways you can use the vampire archetype, um, either by playing it straight or subverting it. And this book is going to be, uh, I think it plays it fairly straight with the sort of general idea of vampires, but I had a lot of fun with it. Um, I did not realize when I first picked it up because I picked it up as ebook that it was a 500 page book. <laughs> so uh, usually I read these books starting on Tuesday night or Wednesday morning, uh, read most of it on Thursday night. I read for several hours last night <laughs> to get this finished. Uh, but the book that I'm bringing today is Silver Under Nightfall by Rin Chupico. So Silver Under Nightfall is a gas lamp fantasy set in a somewhat England-like country of Illyria, though it also spreads out to a more China-inspired country in parts of the novel. It was sold to me as a non-binary-led polyamorous love story, a detective story, and of course, vampire media. So of course I had to pick it up. Our protagonist is Remington Pendergast, more often known as Remy. He is a reaper, an elite bounty hunter of rogue vampires, and an outcast among his fellow reapers, largely because of the rumors that his mother was a vampire at the time of his birth, making him a Cambian, half-vampire himself. He is the only son of Duke Valenbon, though his father might regret that sometimes. He fights for his country, Illyria, even if it rejects him, and at whatever price. We first meet Remy on a hunt, and one he's not particularly thrilled to be on. The Lady Daenerys, a young noblewoman who was once kind to Remy, has been turned, 
and Remy has been sent to destroy her before her frenzy claims more lives. When he finds her, he quickly dispatches her with his comically complex weapon called Breaker. This thing has sides. It has a knife chain. It has knives stuck inside it. It has a sword. It is everything. It is. I don't think too much about how this weapon works. Just, just keep reading the book. Um, at the end, she comes back to lucidity, asking Remy to send her to heaven. Unbeknownst to him, however, there's a group of other vampires watching him who descend upon him as soon as Daenerys is dead. Remy does a good job dispatching them, but before he can take out their leader, another vampire appears, one who is much faster and more skilled than the others. He stops Remy and says that he will take the leader of this group of vampires, apparently his brother, and punish him. Remy doesn't have much choice but to let them go, and he returns home irritated and sick at heart. Remy's father, Duke Valenbon, is waiting for him, so Remy just has time to clean up a bit before he faces his father. His father is less than pleased with him for letting the older vampire and the ringleader of the group go, but there are more pressing concerns. The Queen of Illuria is planning on allying with one of the vampire clans, and there is to be a party where the leaders of those clans are reputed to appear. Remy has been invited, despite his estrangement from most of high society, due to his somewhat reluctant romantic relationship with the Duchess of Astonbury, which he keeps because it affords him access to information he otherwise wouldn't be able to get access to. At this party, he is quickly overwhelmed by all the social expectations he isn't used to, and he flees to the gardens. There he meets Song Xiaodan, a beautiful but sickly woman who flirts with him gently before Remy finds out who she is one of the royal vampires making an alliance with the Queen of Illuria. What's worse, her fiancé, Zidane Malek, is not only the head of the Third Court, but also the vampire who defeated Remy on the night he hunted Lady Daenerys. Remy does not return to the party. He does, does get some information from the Duchess, though, which concerns him. Apparently a young man in an outlying town who was turned into a vampire and hunted down, but he returned after being defeated. What's more, he seemed to mutate, growing to a greater size and having greater strength and speed. Remy decides to investigate the area. When he does, he finds a huge monster prowling the woods, which he fights, seems to defeat, but then it begins to regenerate. He is saved by Song Xiaodan, who reveals that she has the ability to channel sunlight itself through her body, burning the monster to a crisp but exhausting herself in the process. Remy brings her unconscious body to his safe house in gratitude for her saving him, though he's still suspicious of her. When she wakes up, Shadan reveals that she had known about the monster in the past and has fought similar monsters too. She'd been tracking it separately to Remy. Luckily, she was there to save him from it, as only sunlight can destroy the monsters permanently. Otherwise, they can regenerate, even from scraps of bone left over from cremation. Remy wants to learn more, but before he can get more information out of her, the Reapers arrive at his door. It turns out that the Duke of Astonbury has been murdered, and Remy is the prime suspect. Remy has an alibi, but that doesn't seem to matter to them. He's roughed up and put in a cell where he waits for his captors to realize he couldn't have done it. Eventually, surprisingly, Shaodan and Zidane both show up, demanding he be released. To make a long story short, Remy becomes somewhat reluctantly seconded to the third and fourth vampire courts, with Zidane and Shaodan as their representatives to help track down what is causing the strange mutations that seem to be affecting people across the country, which are being referred to scientists working, referred to by scientists working for the crown as the rot. Shaodan is warm and inviting, while Zidane is more aloof, but all of them are intent on finding out what is happening. And is there a connection to the mysterious first court, the vampires who disappeared years ago, but may have been responsible for Remy's mother's death? The rest of this book is part detective story, as the trio try and hunt down the source of the rod, and part romance, as Remy gets closer to Shaodan and Zidane, but struggles to believe that they could be interested in him without ulterior motives. There's plenty of thrilling fight scenes, some spicy romantic scenes, and it all comes to a head with a sequel hook that was quite fun. I did call one of the big twists, though the source of the rot was a surprise to me. I was also surprised by how much focus there is on romance in the second half of the book, though not unpleasantly so. <laughs> the character work that the book does with Remy, Zidane, and Shaodan is definitely the heart of the book, and the strong emphasis on consent and healthy boundaries was refreshing to see, as vampire media can sometimes fall into the trap of more toxic relationship dynamics. Cough, Twilight, cough. 
While it can get quite steamy at points, most of the sexy content is behind a fade to black, which I appreciated as someone who's not much of a reader of the spicy variety. Uh, Remy is also implied to be some form of non-binary, preferring the term of address armager to lord or lady, but uses he him pronouns throughout the novel which was interesting to me. Um, I kind of wish there had been a bit more explicit theming in this regard, but the author is non-binary themselves, and so I'm going to assume this was intentional. Silver Under Nightfall is apparently inspired by Castlevania, which I know almost nothing about, but if you're a fan of this series, you might want to pick a, this book up. But look, we've got some interesting world building and a well-realized mystery. There's snarky banter. There's a pair of vampire horses named Peanut and Cookie who stole my heart. There's hot vampires and a polyamorous relationship with a sarcastic, self-sacrificing little bisexual vampire hunter who learns to trust that he really is worthy of love and affection without strings attached. Is it the best novel I've ever read? No. Am I going to read the sequel? Of course I am. Am I going to watch Castlevania so I get what all the fuss is about? Who knows? But at the end of the day, this was a fun, slightly sexy, and well-plotted piece of vampire media that I'm happy to have on my shelf. If you liked Castlevania but wanted more polyamory, this might be for you. I'm assuming there is no polyamory in the show or games. I may be wrong. If you want a piece of vampire media that's got the romance but also a compelling mystery, this also might be for you. And if you don't want to have to wait for the sequel, just wait a few months because it comes out in April. And with that, we come to the end of our episode about my obsession, that being vampire media, and we also come to the end of my time with you here on Keep It Fictional. It has truly been a pleasure and an honor to chat with my book friends every week, and I look forward to continuing to listen to what great books they have to share in the future. Happy reading, everyone. <laughs>